Hello, my name is Mary Ellen King, president of the Austin Bar Association. This is another episode of the Stock But the Stigma podcast, a podcast that is a part of the initiative of the Austin Bar to stop the stigma and change the conversations around mental health, substance abuse, and thoughts of suicide. Today, we have with us Greg Cox. Hi, Greg. Hi, Mary Ellen. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. It's been a while. Been a while? A couple years, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe probably more than a couple, but I'll just say a couple. Yeah. That <laughs> won't, won't age me that much. Yeah. Um, so tell tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and, and what you do. Uh, so I, I have to confess, I'm not, uh, I'm no longer a member of the Austin Bar. Oh, it's uh, good. Well. Uh, Tarrant County. Uh, so I moved, I was in Austin for, you know, you know, my story well over a decade. Uh, have political background and went to law school and then private practice. And then uh, we worked together at LCRA. Um, and then uh, about three years ago, my wife, who's from Fort Worth, uh, we decided to move to Fort Worth. So that's where I am now. And I run my own firm and do uh, a little bit of commercial litigation, but mostly kind of public law, regulatory affairs, things like that. Yeah, nice. Um, well, great. Thank you for coming on the podcast. The reason I asked you to be on the podcast is that uh, I noticed one day on LinkedIn that you had shared your public story or your story publicly about how you had decided to quit drinking. Yes. Great. Thank you so much for being open and honest about that. I just wanted today to have a conversation with you and learn a little bit more about your decision. How long have you um, been uh, without alcohol, I guess we'll say? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, and it was, uh, I, I posted that, not really thinking much of it, uh, and it just kind of, took on a life of its own. So it's very clear that this issue is close to people's hearts and it's on people's minds, um, which is cool. Um, but my story, I'll be three years without alcohol uh, in December, this December. Uh, and it kind of came out of the blue. I, uh, I've had a, uh, you know, I'm 37. Uh, I've had a 15 year relationship with alcohol, I guess. Um, and it, it just kind of, the long story is, uh, and, and it's, I think it's a cool story. So my, my father-in-law, my wife's dad, sat us down at Thanksgiving in 2021 and said he would be needing uh, a kidney transplant. His kidneys were failing. He'd soon have to go on dialysis. Uh, it was a very emotional time. Um, fast forward a few weeks, December 17th, and I'll never forget that day. I just woke up, and the whole day I just felt like, I didn't want to drink anymore. Um, and I, you know, I had always had a couple of beers every night and, you know, things like that. And I had two kids at the time. Um, and I told my wife, I was like, I don't know what it is. But I just, I don't desire this anymore. I don't want it anymore. Um, and it was weird. It was almost kind of scary. It was, you know, it's like I, this thing that has been in my life for so long. Uh, I, suddenly I'm having these thoughts that I don't want to do it. Uh, and, and, Sounds simple enough, but I think it's a weird thing to struggle through uh, when it's just, you know, it's just something you've kind of done mindlessly for so long. And it's everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a really, I, I was very struck by how much of a decision it was for me uh, because it just felt like it was going to affect my whole life, mm -hmm. uh, which tells you something about your relation. You know, it's like, it feels like it's a very close thing. Right. Um, and so fast forward another few weeks. And I went and got tested to be a donor to my father-in-law thinking I'm not related to him by blood. It's not going to work. She's got other people testing and find out that I'm the best match, uh, even better than my wife who, and, and my sister-in-law, his two daughters. Um, and the doctors are telling me that, you know, if you're willing to donate, you're the best match for him, the best health outcome possible. Um, and so I said, yes. And so we did it. And so it just felt, uh, you know, my, I come from a Christian faith background and felt like something from the Lord. It was kind of preparing me for that process in my life. And, um, it was very cool. And you can be, you can still drink having, after having donated a kidney, but, um, you know, blood pressure is a major contributor to kidney disease and failure and all that. So, um, and alcohol obviously has major blood pressure mm -hmm. implications. And so it felt like, you know, in a way the Lord is kind of looking out for me. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's kind of how I came to it. And, uh, and then after I made that decision, uh, I just started to really reflect on my relationship with alcohol and, uh, became very grateful for the opportunity to give a kidney because I don't think I would have ended my and stopped drinking had that opportunity not mm-hmm. come about. So, um, in, in a way I, I always say it kind of saved my life too. Yeah. Um, so. um, so you said 15 years, was that college when you started drinking or law school? It was right after college. Um, and so I, you know, I had a non-traditional college experience. I went to a private Christian undergrad Bible college, um, and I didn't drink all four years. And, um, that was part of the shtick. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, when we were, when all my friends, when we were in college, we were very self-conscious about that. We, you know, you weren't doing what everybody else was doing. Uh, as I look back now, as I have my own kids, uh, I'm like, man, I have a lot of great memories and college was very fun and happy. And I just remember being a really, you know, I was very much myself mm-hmm. in those years. Um, but after I left, I did, uh, I started drinking much more, uh, especially, um, you know, being away from that environment. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, in, in my mid twenties, it was a lot heavier, um, a lot of binge drinking on the weekends. Um, and then it just continued. I mean, I think once you kind of establish that habit and that association of, I'm, I'm cracking a Miller light, therefore I'm having fun and I'm relaxed. Mm-hmm. It's hard to dissociate those two things. Yeah. Um, and so it just continued and uh, met my wife here in Austin. We got married, started having kids and just kind of, you know, stayed part of my life. And, um, and so, yeah, it was, a, it was a weird thing to untangle. Um, and it was weird to come to the realization that I actually had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. Um, and it was very enlightening. You know, you learn a lot about yourself when you try to give that up. Yeah. Um, so how has your life, uh, changed, you know, now that you've stopped drinking, I think you said three years, three years, um, <laughs> a lot of ways. Uh, and, and I would say, you know, the first six months, it's like, you're thinking about it every day, mm-hmm. thought about it every day. At this point, I never think about drinking. It doesn't occur to me. Uh, it doesn't even sound good sometimes. I think the non-alcoholic beers available today have, you know, they help with like, if I, if I want that taste, I can get it. Um, but it, uh, it, it's, my life has changed. I'm, I'm happier. I think I'm just generally, my, my disposition is more positive. Um, I, I'm able, I would say my capacity for life is greater. Mm-hmm. I have a, an ability to, to just do more stuff. I have more energy. I have more emotional bandwidth. Um, I'm not, you know, I think, I think the common misconception is that alcohol Unla- relaxes you. Relaxes you. <laughs> it's yeah. the opposite. It's the opposite. It 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 pushes things into your subconscious when you should really be dealing with those mm-hmm. things and thinking about those things. Um, and then and so every time those things kind of reappear and assert themselves and say, Hey, remember, you need to think about me. Um, and you take it, you start drinking and you push that back. It's a it's a cyclical process. Mm-hmm. Um and, so and then you don't have to learn how to deal with situations. Yes. Because you're masking it all the yes, time. Yes, right. right. And I think uh, that's the one misconception when you were saying, you know, that it helped you calm down. That was my first thought is really, though, yeah. it doesn't really calm yeah, you down, but right. people think it does. Yes. And then the other thing is, what's, you know, one of the things we've heard is retraining your brain once you stop drinking. Um, we've had some people come in here and talk, and some of them are drinking a significant amount and had been for a while and they really didn't have a choice. They were going to die if they didn't quit. Mm. But one of the things they've said is, you know, retraining your brain to find other ways to de-stress or to cope with your stress. Um, What's some of the ways that you use now that maybe you would have gone to drinking for in the past? Yeah, I would say just dealing with the thing that I'm that I need to deal with, um, you know, whether it's work or a relationship or whatever, I, I just feel more comfortable facing the the challenges and the the friction in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's even exciting in a ways, you know, it's like, um, if you, if you 
have the ability to do something, if you have the ability to practice law, it, it can be fun to, to use those abilities and practice law. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you have the ability to mend a relationship or, or, or seek resolution in a conflict or be present for your family, all that, it, it becomes more rewarding in itself. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, one of my, I always say, my, I've got two go-tos. I love to go take my dogs for a walk. You know, and then the other thing I love to do is read. And Mm. I don't have as much time to like sit and read a book, but I typically love to go. And sometimes I'll find an excuse to go for a drive and listen to my books. Yeah, (laughs) You know, that's the certain, the some things that decompress me. Do you think it's made you a better parent? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And when I stopped drinking, we had two kids and now we have four. Oh, wow. Um, So uh, I think, and and I mean, as stressful, (laughs) as crazy as that is. (laughs) I just can't imagine doing the, and they're five and under. So we're, you know, we're in the thick of it. Um, and my wife, you know, I think it, that's another note is it's helpful to have, you know, some support. I don't mm-hmm. think it's, you can do this stuff alone. Um, and so when I told my wife I was going to give it up, she immediately hopped on board with me. Yeah. Um, so that made it, you know, a hundred times easier. Oh, wait. So she um, stopped drinking too. And she did as well. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's great to have an um, accountability partner, yes. right? Yeah. And cause that's sometimes, you know, what happens and you hear people say they're in this system where it's broken and everybody's drinking around them and it gets hard to stay there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing when you hear people that go to rehab, sometimes they say, don't go back to your, your system. Don't go back to your hometown or don't go back to where you live or don't go back to that group of friends because those friends are still making the bad choices Mm -hmm. and it's easy. So having somebody to do that as an accountability uh, partner, that's incredible. Did you, before you stopped drinking, did you have anybody else in your life who maybe said, you know, you're drinking too much or I don't like you when you drink or, or did you have internal feelings if you didn't really like yourself when you drank? Um, I don't think I ever had those feelings consciously where I would articulate them, but I could sense there was something not right about me. You know, I, um, I think in, in hindsight, you know, you kind of look at yourself after you haven't been drinking for a while and you look at the years when you were and you realize, ah, I just, I handled so much stuff in a terrible way. Right. Um, and my wife's told me, you know, I'm not a perfect husband by any stretch of the <laughs> imagination, but you know, I think I'm much calmer. I'm a little slower to be agitated or annoyed. Um, and so I, I think I just never tied those things to alcohol. Right. Um, I just thought oh, this is just who I am. And, I have these problems and I need to work on these problems. And maybe if I just, yeah, you know, buckle down, I can be better. Uh, I never, it never occurred to me that maybe there's something I'm doing or I'm, I'm doing something to my body or I'm not taking care of myself in some way um, that could help me. Yeah. I, again, it just, it just really blows my mind that people, you know, really think they're drinking alcohol to help them calm down. Mm-hmm. And it's never, it just never works that way. No. Much more agitated, much yeah. more. Um, you know, and I say to people, you know, a lot of people say you, th- you think you're going to drink and it puts you to sleep, but you really, studies show that you don't drink, you don't sleep right. as well yeah. and, and all of those things. So you don't eat, you know, you're not eating healthy. So all of that leads to agitation right. and unhealthy feelings. Yes. I did have a friend, one of my good friends, long time, former roommate in Austin, uh, who he, he had, he's been sober a lot longer than me. And I watched, you know, I lived with him when he when he was drinking and then I watched him, you know, kind of give it up and just watching his journey and his walk, it was really inspiring and incredible. So we'd always, I'd always talk to him about it. And, um, I could sense that I could sense the change in him. I could see it in him. And, and he always had a great saying, uh, that, you know, when I was enjoying it, I wasn't controlling it. And when I was controlling it, I wasn't enjoying it. So I just had to, be done with it. Get it, give it up. Um, yeah. And so I, and that, that rang very true for me too. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible how it controls people's lives and it doesn't yeah. take long. No. Yeah. It doesn't no. take long at all. Um, what do you think that is the most rewarding aspect of your life now that you have stopped drinking? Um, I, th- I think just my, my family, my marriage, my relationship with my kids, I really don't think I would be in as healthy a position or 
I mean, not to toot my horn, like I'm this great family guy. I'm not, I have still plenty of room for improvement, but I just, I, I feel like I know my wife. I feel like I know my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't spend a lot of, you know, I'm not looking for ways to go out at night and drink and, you know, I, I'm up with them in the morning. I, I'm doing bedtime at night. Um, and so, I mean, just from a time and bandwidth standpoint, um, you have more energy. I have more energy and yeah. it's really, it's enjoyable and, yeah. um, and I can see the fruits of it. So it is. And when nice. they're that young, they do love to get up early in the morning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's very important. Yeah. Um, so what has been the biggest adjustment for you overall, uh, just in life? I mean, in your practice or in your social life or in life in general, what's been the biggest adjustment for you now that you've quit drinking? I think being in the political field and the legal field, it's a very uh, social drinking field. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're drinking is a part of it. Uh, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not ignorant. I, th- I think I'll probably miss a lot of business development opportunities or, uh, you know, I, I think that's just part of it. People, when you, when your guard's down, you can connect with people and they open up more and you, you know, um, you know, and just time. So I think that's, that's a hard part of, at least in my work, finding ways to get with people and, and, and you know, running my own firm and running my own business and having those connections and sales Outside opportunities. Of cocktail and, hour. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, okay. Uh, I, you know, adjusting to that and it'll always be an adjustment, but I, I think I'm fortunate to be at a time where a lot of people have walked this journey before me yes. and set a precedent where it's easier for me as a 37 year old, older millennial <laughs> to kind of engage in business development without alcohol than it was before right. so um, you know one of the things i love to do is have coffee meet people for coffee yes, yeah. or lunch mm-hmm. you know instead of after work and then especially now you know when you become a parent um especially as the kids get older you know i mean t- this afternoon my son has baseball practice t- tuesday wednesday thursday has football practice you know i mean it's just like something every night so then you you're able to fit it all in your business development into your day and be a parent at night. And so it kind of mm-hmm. works out, right? Yeah. I mean, in the long run, it all works out for the best. That's right. I think, you know, one thing that is so prominent, especially for young attorneys, we were just talking about young attorneys or young individuals is FOMO, the mm. fear of missing out yes. on this culture that is drinking and partying and music festivals and all the things that are, you know, on the billboards everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. So what would you say to somebody who has real FOMO and feels like, you know, not going to the parties and drinking is, is going to impact them in negative ways? Everything that's happening in the world is not happening at cocktail hour. I would just say that. That's right. There's plenty of exciting things to be involved in and do outside of the weekend parties or the cocktail hours um, or you know, the festivals and things like that. Um, but it is, you know, I think I, if you have fear of missing out, I, I think sitting down and brainstorming how to deal with it when mm-hmm. you, when it hits or when it's there, or like, what are some other things to do? Cause I think a lot of times you just, you get tunnel vision. You think this is the only option available to me. Because like we said, it's controlling. Um, yes. It's controlling um, your thoughts. This is the only way I, I know how to connect with people. Um, this is the only activity I know that's available to me. Um, I have, I know an older guy that doesn't drink, um, who's kind of in this profession and spent a lot of time in DC, um, and was always being invited. He was the subject of many lob, many lobbyists, uh, attention. And so he, you know, his, he didn't want to go to the steakhouses and the happy hours and all that. So, um, he said, I run every morning, so come run with me. Yeah. Um, and you know, he was, he thought nobody would ever take him up on it, but they did. he was, they really did. So I think, you know, when you, you propose stuff like that, or you kind of think outside the box, um, people are really open to it. You right. know? And, and, and I found a lot of people are actually relieved that they don't have to go sit at the bar or yeah. go to the happy hour and have a drink and do all this stuff that they, they want an opportunity to just connect. That's not after work, yeah. uh, you know, in the Davy, as we say in Fort Worth. Um, I think too, like sometimes I think, you know, so I love to dance. And I'll go, I will just go dance, you know, without a drink. I don't care. That's what I like. Right. 
But uh, sometimes, you, and you, th- you said this earlier when you were talking, I forgot what we were talking about. You said something about courage. Sometimes alcohol, we feel like, gives us courage. The reality, is, though, it doesn't. Mm. It's not doing something when you're drinking. Um, it's not the right kind of courage. But when you're not drinking and facing fear or facing anxiety and then acting in spite of it, when you're 100% without any kind of substance, is also life changing. Right. You know, it develops you as a person, and it makes you a better, stronger person, even if you can't dance. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes. Sometimes it's just yes. about having fun. Yes. You know, whether or not you can dance, I can't dance. I just like to dance. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think that too. Like, I think people associate drinking with courage when, in fact, it's the opposite. Right. It's really not. Yeah. Um, it's courage it's, to be yourself. Yes. And. Um, you know, again, this sounds hocus pocusy or millennially. So, uh, <laughs> but it really is true that you learn about yourself more when you're not drinking. Yes. Um, I have more confidence going to a happy hour networking event and just shaking hands and talking to random people and introducing myself. Um, I don't, you know, it's almost like alcohol kind of held me back in that. Like I needed that and then I could do it. Um, but now I'm, I'm more, more confident in who I am. I understand myself better. Um, I'm more interested in people naturally, which is a, a great thing yeah. when you're developing business. Uh, uh, you know, not that that's what it's all about, but you're, well, it is. Yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> uh, We're business people. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I think it. You know, you you'll find you have people think they need courage. Well, you'll find when you stop drinking. I think you you. You don't need as much courage. Right. Um, you you start to learn to do things that you didn't think you could do before. Right. And your need for courage kind of goes away. Right. Um, now, so that, that face everything and rise uh, fear acronym, you yes. know, um, I love that. And that's what you get when you don't, um, when you're not drinking to get yeah, your courage. You absolutely. Know? Uh, what, would you, what advice would you give others who are maybe on the fence uh, about stopping drinking or who are really struggling and in the throes of their addiction? I think everybody's different. It's always a tough question. I don't want to dole out advice right. and say, this is what worked for me, so it'll absolutely work for you. Um, I think everybody's story is unique. I know my story is unique. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me has been just being open about it um, and saying, you know, even if I'm not, you know, whether you can't get up in the morning and go to work, that type of problem, or whether you just aren't present for your family and, and doing the things you know you should be doing, you know, just, just talk to somebody, go, mm-hmm. go ask for some help. I think what I have found is, I mean, we're sitting here today uh, and in other circumstances, people are much more willing to listen, mm-hmm. be helpful um, and not judge and not condemn. Um, and, and that was a huge realization for me. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, okay. I, I think I'm going to be okay. Um, I'm not going to go, I don't have to show up to work and announce that I've given up alcohol <laughs> yeah. and I don't have to. It's you know, a personal choice. Right, yes. Kind of like voting. You don't have to go tell anybody yeah. who you vote for. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You can just decide and uh, the people around you will be a part of that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and The people it, that matter. The people that matter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and, and sometimes people that will, people will really surprise you. Um, I know that's, that was the case for me. People you thought would be kind of, oh, you know, that won't last or whatever, uh, are really supportive. And, and, and the thing about giving up alcohol and being open about it is alcohol is one of those things where as soon as you say you don't drink or somebody watches you at dinner, not order a glass of wine, uh, they will immediately start talking about their own relationship with drinking. Um, and so it really, it's sometimes it's a weird thing. It's like, I never said anything. I I just, all I did was just order dinner without a glass of wine and immediately people want to start talking about it. And why'd you do it? Yeah. Why'd you do it? Um, or, or they start justifying their own, you know, they're going to order a glass. I so had a bad day. I know, need a glass had, of wine. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just very, you can tell it's very, it's personal to everybody. Right. Um, and I think that's something that to keep in mind and everybody's story and journey is different. Yeah. Um, I, I've found that too, you know, and, and I may ask people, I'm, I'm much more aware now that I've, the things I've been through, 
But uh, I love to hear why people have chosen not to drink. That's mm. why I invited you here. Yeah. I wanted to hear about yeah. it, right? <laughs> I just love to hear about it because everybody has different stories. Yes. Everybody that sat at this table with us and talked about their decision to quit drinking has all been for different reasons, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, and b- that's because we're all human and we're all very different, right? Mm-hmm. One size doesn't fit everybody. So I'm very excited that you're here to share that today. Um, and I would say also that, you know, if you're, if you're on the fence or you're, you're thinking about it or you, you at least are assessing your relationship with alcohol, uh, I would emphasize the importance of that assessment. Um, if, if you think in your gut and in your mind that there's something there that you need to do or think about, go do it. Do whatever it takes. Take some time off work. You know, find sitters, whatever you need to do, and and get that right because it, you know, that that it's it's not a not non important decision. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, for me at least, it has what started as really a a weird kind of gut instinct has turned into what, transformational transformation, and yeah. probably the best decision I've made, you know, in my adult life outside of you know marrying my wife and <laughs> having, having four kids. kids. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. uh, you know, it's, it, it really is important. And there's a reason your, your mind and your gut are saying, think about this. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. your body's probably saying this makes me feel terrible. Right. right. Yes. Um, so early, you said when you first started early on, you know, it was tough cause you did think about drinking every day. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about what did you do to maybe not take the drink or, or how did you have to talk to yourself or did you make decisions or what was happening there? Because I think that's the one thing that you do. People that are drinking daily do negotiate with, you know, I really want to drink. I really want to drink. Cause that ends up being the coping mechanism for Mm -hmm. the stress. I've had a bad day. I think I want to drink (laughs) instead of I had a bad day. I think I'm going to take a nap or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go work out the gym. So what did you do? A number of things. Uh, I worked out a lot in that season. Uh, I did a lot of running. Um, you know, I also had a surgery coming up on the Go horizon. Ahead. So I, I was extremely focused on, you know, the doctors kept telling me, the better shape you're in, the faster your recovery will be. So I really wanted to be in the best physical condition, a lanky, 30 something lawyer. <laughs> I mean, cause yeah. that's a big surgery. Uh, that's not a yeah. minor ordeal, right? No. Yeah. No. Um, and so that was on my mind. So it was distracting me a little bit, but, uh, so I did a lot of running. I did a lot of biking. Um, and you know, I ate whatever I wanted. To, so, that's uh, good. <laughs> I used, I shifted my emotional outlet from alcohol to food. So, um, you know, and I think that's okay. And yeah. those first, you know, so, so some people I know it's sugar. They eat a lot of sugar um, because there's just that that craving mechanism is there. Um, and so, but I think you know having that plan of knowing, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and then just becoming all in on that is mm-hmm. was really helpful to me. Yeah, you know, when you decided to make this decision, obviously your wife supported you, and she wanted to join in with you to be an accountability partner, which that's incredible. Um, what did your extended family say? Or how do how do you think they thought about it? Um, they were well, both the both sides of my family, my wife's family and my family aren't they're not big drinkers. There's alcohol around, but uh it wasn't we weren't worried about causing a scene or feeling any pressure. Um I think if anything, I I, I probably go in and out of phases and stuff. So I think it was my family uh just waiting to see how long it would really last. Um and so uh, you know, the longer it's lasted, I think they're like, okay, wow. He was uh, for real. He was for real. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so feels good. I rubbed that in on him a little bit. <laughs> you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I was going to do this. Yeah. Um, how do you think it's changed your perspective of the world? If at all, just not having alcohol. Um, that's a great question. I think not to sound cheesy or cliche, but I think it's made, it's made me more of an optimist in life. I, I, I live every day with the sense that things are going to work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, part of that is because I'm without alcohol, I'm more willing to take risks, mm-hmm. whether it's a starting my own law firm or 
uh, an emotional risk or just, you know, being present with people and, uh, and being genuine and, and, and that sort of thing. I, I think I've, I've developed a belief and a faith that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in the world and I hope the best for my friends. I hope the best for myself. Uh, and so I just more of, more of an optimistic outlook on life. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, and I think it, and, and I really mean that, I mean, it's a very stark contrast in how I viewed the world and, and my day to day living between before drinking and, and drinking now. Um, I think I'm a lawyer, so I'm still a little cynical by nature. Yes, um, but, yes. And the more you're a lawyer, the more yeah, cynical you are. Yes. Right? Uh, but I'm less so. Um, and I feel in less competition with everybody around me than I probably did before. So, yeah, that's nice. What do you, what, what was, some, what is the one thing you would change about society and the way they embrace or I think sometimes encourage drinking? What's the one thing you think we could do better? I, the, I don't know. I don't have any slick answers, but I do think we don't talk enough about how dangerous alcohol mm -hmm. as a substance really is. Um, and, and it's stuff we know. And I think it's always shocking to me and this health and wellness society we're living in, all the things we're finding out about gluten and protein and, you know, all the different ways to eat and the, and the things in our food and all these things. Um, you know, I hear from some people who tout all the benefits of those things and I'm, I'm one of them, but still drink alcohol regularly. And I think, you know, it's just really interesting because I mean, I'm not a scientist. I dichotomy. Dichotomy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, it's like, it's like tobacco. It's, you know, if you take this out of your diet, that's a huge improvement on your health. Right. Um, all and long-term too. Long-term. I mean, all your major organs will be relieved. You'll have far better long-term health outcomes. Even if you just change nothing else, just removing alcohol um, has proven benefits. And I mean, I think we're finding out too, it's more linked to, you know, things like cancer and, yeah. and terrible diseases like that. So um, I just think we should be more forthcoming about the real mm -hmm. physical scientific dangers that are in alcohol. You know, what I find incredible, and I don't know if it's just because we're in a college town, but I remember before I realized that I had this addiction problem in my family, you know, with my ex-husband who just passed away, um, I, rem I remember it all just becoming, I became hyper aware of it, mm. right? So if you're driving on certain roads in Austin, every single billboard is alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't, yeah. at the, and then I'm thinking, you know, I'm not consciously paying attention to it till it becomes a trigger for me because mm -hmm. at that point it was, um, but our kids, everybody that yeah. they're just subconsciously seeing, you know, all these advertisements constantly yes. and it never had, it's always beautiful people having yeah. fun. You know, it's yeah. never the, the accurate and true side right. of what happens with the progression of yes. drinking alcohol. Right. Yeah, I mean, you think about how how far the public image of tobacco has come, and smoking is now associated with kind of an unhealthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's amazing we haven't made that connection and association with alcohol. With alcohol. Yeah, uh, I mean, they, there's rules around not having children, you know, animals and stuff that would appeal to children on the smoking, but we've really not gotten to that point with alcohol, uh, and it's such a prominent part of our life that would be almost life-changing for everyone mm -hmm. to kind of move to that direction. Yeah. But that's what I'm hoping. I mean, you know, I don't, and I'm not, I don't want to say I think people are inherently bad for drinking. Everybody has their choice. Mm -hmm. I think that people that have drank too much or binge drink too much, I mean, uh, it's defined in different, different ways. Um, if they feel bad about it, that's probably their gut telling them mm -hmm. something's not yeah. right. I know very few people who truly drink in moderation. Right. Uh, and, and have a healthy relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. I think there are very, very few people. For every person that tells me I don't have a problem, I think probably maybe two out of ten mm -hmm. are, are probably telling the truth. Telling the truth. And in science, I, mean, I think the doctors, the, the medical literature tells us that, you know, the, 
you know, things like for adult males is four to six drinks a week is kind of in the regular. Uh, and most do them. four to six drink in a day. Exactly. Right. Um, and so I know very few people who fit that kind of moderation right. profile. Um, and that that's something I think we ought to be more aware of. Yeah. You know, and, and then just the, just the way I wish people would just give it a chance. The way you feel when you stop drinking. Oh yeah. It's night and day. The sleep is, I mean, the sleep's the first thing you, you notice. Yes. It's like, I can't believe I never slept this well, um, which contributes to every other part of your mm -hmm. life. Um, your, your mood and your, your anxiety. Your anxiety. I mean, everything. Yes. Yeah. You don't uh, sleep, eat. No. You know, I, that's what I say all the time. When my son's having a tantrum or when he doesn't really have tantrums, he's nine, but when he's not feeling well, I'm like, did you eat? Did you drink? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. maybe you need to go to bed early, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. somehow we know how to give that to our children, but we yes. fail to right. recognize that we also yes. need it because we are the same thing, right. uh, same people as them. Um, do you think the practice of law has gotten easier for you now that you've stopped drinking? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm a, I'm I'm kind of a part litigator. Um, I, re I really deal more in in the public realm, um, and which is you know stressful. There's a lot of things on the line at times, um, and I think just being able to bear a load of stress is easier when you're not drinking. Mm -hmm. um, and and like I said earlier, I'm instead of looking for a way out of the stress, I my mind and my 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 stability is more focused on getting through the stress yeah. um, and, and getting it done mm -hmm. and behind me rather than escaping from it. Right. Cause guess what? When the mask comes off or the alcohol wears yes. off, guess what? That stress is still, still there. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you have another drink to right. hide the stress yes. again. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing universally everybody's like, you know, it's just a mask to, to hide something mm -hmm. that's a deeper issue. And then, you know, it is progressive. Um, so one drink turns into, like you said, two drinks or three drinks or four drinks. Mm -hmm. And it's like once a week turns into almost daily. Yes. And then the next thing you know, you've lost control of it and it's controlling you. Yeah. You know, it truly does. I mean, yes. that's why you think when you say, you know, I don't think about a drink every single day, but if you're thinking about a drink every single day, alcohol has control of you. Yes. You've lost control, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, completely. Yeah. Um, so do you have any advice for young attorneys uh, I consider you pretty young, <laughs> uh, but you know, the younger attorneys who are just getting started, um, my law firm just set it a new crop of first years. Do you have any advice for them about, uh, our profession and drinking and, you know, maybe making better choices or safer choices in their early, early in their career? Um, Yes, and I always I'm I'm right at the age where I'm either a young attorney or I'm an I'm an older attorney. So uh, well, if you remember the Austin bar, you would still be eligible for the young attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my litmus <laughs> yes. test, right? Um, I think the the habits you form in law school in the first few years, first few years out of law school, are habits that will stick with you for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the methods. You know, we're talking about dealing with stress and coping with stress and pressure. The way you learn and teach yourself to cope with pressure and stress when you're a young lawyer is how you will continue to cope with it mm -hmm. as you grow. And, you know, as if you're a young lawyer, you know, I was married, I was the married guy in law school, but I didn't have any kids. And if you if you're in law school and you get out, you know, the, the stress of the profession is, bad. is the it's, same, it's, yeah. but then the stress of your personal life will also increase. Yes. And so as you get married and you have kids or you do whatever, you know, you, as you get older and more capable, you, your life will only, you'll only be given more responsibility. That's right. And so if you don't learn to deal with the pressure of that responsibility properly, it's going to eat your lunch 10 to 15, 20 yeah. years down the line. So true. So true. And, you know, I mean, it's true. You know, I joked, uh, uh, our, our, uh, law school, the way they got everybody to kind of get together was beer and pizza. Mm. But, uh, I hope now law schools and I don't know, I'm, I'm so far removed, but I hope law schools have really started changing the way they focus on alcohol, yeah. you know, for the younger, for the younger people, because that's, that's really important. And, and it's so true what you're talking about when you're, you're saying that about the young associates and I'm thinking like that starts early on too, right? Even just think about the same study habits you had to develop in primary and secondary, you had to carry those into college and mm -hmm. law school. And, 
And then the other thing is, gosh, this is such a stressful profession. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, you know, people don't come to us when they're having a good day. No. I don't know of any profession where they do. You know, even if you're just doing probate and will work, somebody's coming to you contemplating their death. Yes. You know, that's that's complex and right. that's heavy. And uh, a lot is expected of us. And I joke about this all the time. People in the general public tend to put us on a pedestal. We're just people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like, and some of us do not deserve to be on a pedestal no. at all. But uh, it's just a tough profession. But I love my job. I mean, I'm a litigator through and yes. through. You heard me sitting here talking. I'm supposed to get a trial starting in a month on Monday. I love that, but it's, it's hard mm -hmm. and it's very stressful. Yes. Um, you know, there's one thing for sure in the middle of trial, you cannot drink, no. <laughs> you know, you, you yeah. gotta be hyper-focused yes. on all the details and that's just not end trial that's leading up to trial and right. then after trial. And so, you know, catching yourself in that pattern of the fallback to the drinking is just, it's yes. not going to serve you well. Right. I love the way you say it. it will eat your lunch. Yeah. It will. It will, control, it will control you. It will control you. That's right. And, and I, I, the other thing I would say to young attorneys, I mean, to anybody really, is I like to think, and since I stopped drinking, I've been able to view, I think you can view yourself, this is going to sound real focus, maybe focus. new agey, hocus okay. pocus. <laughs> Very millennial-ish. Millennial yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it comes down to your identity. And I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the, the drinking cycle in the legal profession is because of an identity that's associated with the system, the legal system. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think since I've stopped drinking, I've been able to view myself and my existence and my worth, uh, and outside my value of outside of that system. 100%. I work in that system and I go into it every day. Uh, but it's not what it doesn't give me my value. That's right. I give I give value to it. That's right. Um, and and I think that's really important, especially for young lawyers, because you're so eager to be affirmed by the system you're going into and by the profession you're going into, that it can really uh, it can suck you in and kind of you know make you think something. So you know, separating yourself from that con you know that system of conflict uh, is really important. I think you know is one way to kind of. Take a big breath at yeah. the end of the day and go. Yeah, and you need to, to learn that early on because if you if you end up having children, they will force you <laughs> to learn <laughs> yes. that, you know, yeah. that you are not the practice of law. Yes. I just want to share with you this year as president of the Austin Bar Association, of course, my Stop the Stigma is the big initiative this year. The other thing we're doing is we're, we're providing non-alcoholic drinks at every event that has alcoholic drinks. You know, some people uh, still want to have the taste or they mm -hmm. still want to have the glass in their hand. Um, but anyways, we're giving people those options uh, if that's something they want. So they or if they, you know, they're afraid somebody might, might make comments because they're not comfortable mm -hmm. in their decision not to drink. Yeah, we want to give them that opportunity. Um, what's some things that you've done um, that you feel like has really helped you continue to stay off the path of drinking? I mean, do you still run or what do you do now that, that helps you kind of decompress and, and work through your stress or thoughts? I do still run. I, I play basketball a few times a week, um, pick up basketball, which I uh, started that about a year ago. And my goal was to start making some three pointers. <laughs> and so, and I actually yeah, made, practice. Yeah. It's <laughs> starting to pay off. So I've dusted off the, the, the skills or, or lack thereof, however you see it. Um, I like my dancing. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> uh, but I think, yeah, just sweating, uh, getting outside, mm -hmm. um, getting your heart rate up. I mean, those are always helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, and the more, I, the, the less I, the, these three years without alcohol, um, I enjoy that more. I mean, it's like, I'm, I wouldn't call myself more athletic, uh, but I'm, the the process of working out and running and recovering is just so much more enjoyable. I don't feel like I'm just trying to get back to level set from the day before, the night before. Um, I'm actually kind of making improvements and I can see progress. And, yeah. Um, you know, and sometimes you just need to go punch a pillow. Or, uh, <laughs> There's know. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or might be uh, a boxing bag. I love yeah. to, when they have that at the right at the gym. Well, Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been incredible to hear your story. We're trying to bring in people with different backgrounds, and this is a new perspective that we've not heard before. Um, 
you know, and I really, it takes a lot of courage to number one, stop drinking in, a, in this profession where there is a huge focus on it. And uh, it takes a lot of courage to come and tell your story publicly. So I really appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for what y'all are doing and, and, and enabling people like myself and younger lawyers to have an environment where they can be healthy and not form uh, bad habits and addictions in their life. Yeah, so I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Stop the Stigma podcast. Don't forget, if you feel like you need help, you can always call uh, TLAP or if you feel like you're having thoughts of suicide because of your substance abuse, you can always call 988 and receive assistance. And we'll see you in the next episode of Stop the Stigma podcast.